Hello, I'm Peter Bell, and I'm here with Mr. James Sykes, Appia Energy. Hello, James. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me again. Wonderful. Yeah, it was a pleasure to talk to you once before and read and follow your progress since then. Um, first drill results out today, November 26, 2018. Yep, absolutely. It's a very exciting stepping stone for Appia, especially on our Alice Lake project, where we think this is a project that has uh, some large legs to make a, a big step forward in the rare earth space. So having these drill results come out, uh, prove that what we have seen at surface is is we're seeing them at depth and we're also seeing more at depth. So yeah, again, it's a Great. very exciting time for Appia. Yeah, I remember the news release we talked about before, um, talking about outlier grades in some of the surface sampling results and then today that headline number um, a very large total rare earth oxide um, as far as i understand it they're 10 percent plus absolutely yep it, it's hard to find grades like that uh, anywhere else in some of these global rare earth projects and, and that's again one of the things that really differentiate us from amongst our peers is just that, that high grade potential you can find that at yeah. minus corp and you can find that in uh, at uh, Rainbow Rare, Rainbow was project in, in Africa, but really outside of that, there's there's nothing else. And geological setting for Alsace Lake versus those two? A little bit different. Uh, most of those, I, I, I have Linus Corp's in a carbonatite. Um, Rainbow is uh, their veins. There are some thick veins. Ours is uh, actually quite unique. It, again, it's a uh, metasomatic late structural deposit that just rips right through the the nice that was originally there so there's that structural nature to it which i'm happy about myself because i'm a, i consider myself a structural geologist and i can understand that and it, it the structures that you see up there they they really contain the ore they constrain it when you can you can go from nice coast rock to to the ore system in the in in the blink of an eye, it's it's a knife sharp contact, which is again another good good point for us going forward. Is that you know in in a scenario where we do potentially mine these things, we would have no outside dilution. Well, grade and uh, or or and waste, right? The, separating those two things out that's uh, yep. critically important. But potentially mining scenarios, the wall rock you know there's all kinds of questions that come in with that competency yep. Yep, yeah it's all competent rock the the material the the host rock the the structural host rock the metasomatic um, ore system is is basically almost similar to the host rock uh just mineralogically a little yep. bit different uh but you, you can you can basically um Consider it a pegmatite in a way. We're seeing massive feldspar crystals, massive accumulations of biotite in this metasomatic system, and then the host rock is just a typically uh, metamorphosed, uh, nice material that's uh, uh, paleo proterozoic uh, sedimentary nice. And so quartz looking... rich, quartz rich, very very defined, very defined sharp contacts. Yeah, and and over small widths. Um, so not, you wouldn't call this a vein system at this point. No, it again, but because it has that structural system and, and it's had that fluid incorporation, you yeah. can almost consider it a vein system too, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as a vein, but yeah. it does have similarities to a vein system. Well, Looking at um, from four to four point eight, the depths on some of these intersections, right? And <laughs> yeah, near surface. Yep, absolutely. So connecting up with um, what you saw at surface, then with uh, very clearly. Yep, where where we drilled the surface zones, yes, and we did intersect them all at depth, and so yeah, they 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 connect for sure. And, and then, how how deep were some of the deeper holes, right? Um, looking at the full breakdown by rare earth elements here, and 
all the depths as reported, um, you know, below, uh, above 20 meters, it looks like. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Everything was very shallow to surface. Great. Our deepest, our deepest drill hole was just over 40 meters. Yeah. Again, testing to see, testing to see if there were any more deeper zones. But yeah, basically where we have seen everything, it's, it's all been very close to surface. Yeah, well, I know cross sections included here, but I guess with those kind of depths, uh, not uh, entirely necessary if you're hitting stuff where you expect it to and uh, mapping it, connecting it back to what you see at surface. Yeah, the cross sections make things they they kind of make things look a little bit skewed. Like they look, they make them look a lot larger than they do, um, which yeah is a good thing. But uh, we, <laughs> you know, we didn't want to to put out too much. We want to keep things, uh, especially if we want to get to a resource stage, that's when we really want to to get things out there. But right now, a couple holes in each zone doesn't really do, um, uh, wouldn't do much justice having a cross-section out there. Early days, first holes into these targets, right? Yep, yep absolutely. Great. And, and the uranium numbers, um, those don't look to be particularly high. They're not. No, they. I guess they would be considered a low-grade deposit, but they could be separated quite easily in the process for extracting rare earths. Well, and I wonder about you know the, the genetic side, the genetic model of these things. How you come along? Why there would be uranium in them in the first place, and then down the line in a ma mining scenario, does the presence of elevated levels of uranium, you know, is that a problem? Not necessarily. No, just. Because of what we're dealing with, um, all of our rare earths are hosted in monazite. Monazite has thorium, another radioactive mineral, in its crystal structure naturally. So regardless of what we do, we will have some uh, some radi radioactive materials in the monazite to deal with. Now, the reason why we have uranium in there is because uranium has been replacing some of the thorium in, in the crystal structure of the monazite. Yep, okay. All the... and. Again, is the thorium being the more common version, right, of this radio? <laughs> the geology of these uranium deposits is is largely beyond me, and and the rare earth stuff too. I'm still, you know, grappling trying to figure out the basics. <laughs> well, for uranium, it's uh, like the Athabasca uranium deposits. I think uh, those are all basically structural plays in there. Uh, you're you're just looking for pure uranium almost. Yeah, at so and at the change. at the nonconformity too, right? There's this kind of clear structural yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they follow all structure. Well, not all structures, but yeah, they're all they're all structurally controlled so in again, the I, basin. Yeah. Yes, in the basin. Yeah. And I this, recall what, what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is is quite different though from from these Athabasca deposits. Um, yeah, again, because we're it, it's basically it's a fluid system that carried. Uh, the ingredients to make monazite, and and that's exactly what it did. And so, primary mineralization here, or is it secondary? The primary in the structure, for sure. Okay. And lots more to discuss, um, even about the uranium and all that. But uh, just to point out uh, some guidance around plans for 2019, a uh, 3,000 meter drill program. Yep, that's. That's a good uh, good first start for us. Again, because we have our we have the drill up there, we own it. Uh, hopefully, we can actually drill more than that. We're just ah. you know, trying to be a little bit conservative right now. Uh, we figure that 3,000 meters could actually give us a couple of resource estimates on both the the Charles area, which would be Charles and Bell and Charles Lower, but also over at the Ivan and Dillon area. And meterage on this program. Um, over under 500 meters? Yes. Yeah, uh, under 500. Yeah. We drilled 15 drill holes for approximately 335 meters. <laughs> Wonderful. And any uh, information on expenditure associated with all that? Uh, not something we typically see in news releases, but comes out eventually to some degree in the financials. Um, companies always appreciate, I always appreciate when there's some <laughs> information on how much money got spent. <laughs> We're still collecting bills, so we have, we have nothing finalized yet. <laughs> Wonderful. And I guess um, you were, were you out there with the drills? Yep. Yeah, I spent a lot of my summer out there. Great. 
And uh, I got my nice healthy dose of radiation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's it's actually it's 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 quite surprising out there. Um, just because I know uh, there's a lot of negative connotation with uh, anything radioactive, and I've been in this industry long enough to know, and I try to educate people on this. They, so we wear we wear monitors, and they tell yeah. us how often we're or uh, you know, the exposure rate that we've been ex- that we've been exposed to, and you know all of our people up there were well below the guidelines. I think the guidelines say you can have 50 um, 50 microsieverts in five years or 10 in in one year, and you know all of our guys are below one. We 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 kept one of the badges as a control point on uh, up the Wilson zone, and just left it there for the summer. And when it came back, it was still below 50. <laughs> so again, you'd have to spend, you'd have to sleep out there. You'd have to live out there. You'd have to just spend, mm. you know, your entire life not moving from these rocks yeah. to get a high concentration of radiation. And well, nobody's ever going to do that. Yeah. And interesting that even at surface, um, that there is that much coming off the ground. I guess that's um, regional ge- geophysics, all that, right? It would be yeah. fairly well known. Yeah, and because it's thorium, it's not as radioactive as uranium. Yeah. So the, uh, and again, it's all alpha particles mostly, which are easily stopped by the skin. Yeah. Um, they don't travel very far, which is, which is why when we're walking around with the scintillometer up there, we can't even see. We couldn't see some of these zones below a foot of overburden material, <laughs> which doesn't. Yeah. It, that's not a lot of material. But yeah. again, if if one foot of overburden masks your your radioactive signal. Who knows what else is out there? Yeah, well, and I guess that's where it comes down to having a, a more high-powered um, geophysical program. And yep. great to see but, mention of that in the news release, right? Um, detailed ground survey, a ground gravity survey yep. planned for next year. And I'd love to hear more about that. And, and the nine other showings identified uh, prior programs. Yep. Great. Yeah, a lot of potential out there. And that's again not just with the not just with the stuff at surface, but what we what we drilled and intersected uh, the lower zones, um, you know, these subsurface zones, just really opened up our eyes to how much can actually be out there. Yeah. And then we start we start going back and looking at well, you know, there are showings over here, showings over here, all these things that we can <laughs> we can get access to. So it just everything just keeps keeps piling on, keeps adding up. Yeah. So again, that's a uh, yeah big a lot of work to do next summer. Oh, and isn't that the way that the best uh, exploration projects shape up to be, right? Uh, the more you look, the more you find. Exactly, yes. Yeah, good good way of looking at it, for sure. I, uh, with, and, with the gravity survey, I just want to touch on that. Uh, again, so typically in, in uranium exploration in the basin, we're looking for gravity lows because we're not actually looking for uranium itself. We're looking for the alteration halo around the uranium because that's it's larger and it it really affects the gravity of the rocks around it, making it uh, a lower signal. Out out where we are at Alsus, we're looking at the complete opposite, because we have no alteration, and the monazite, uh, these clusters of monazite, are at a much higher density than the surrounding rocks. We're going to mm-hmm. be looking for gravity highs. Yeah. Because they're close to surface, these highs are really going to be amplified. So yeah. this is this is a very key exploration tool for us going forward. That we're not, we don't have to waste drill dollars by, you know, just Swiss cheesing the ground. Yeah, we can do things. We can do things economically. We can do things efficiently. Get a gravity survey done in areas that we haven't gone to yet, uh, like in between Charles, in between Ivan, in between Wilson. All that small little area, we can see what's below there, and then we can drill those off. But then also to all of these other areas that are outside these the zones that we've uh, exposed. Wonderful. Yeah. And to anyone lost, um, just to point out that that's very different from what you were saying with regards to the radiation that comes up and can get blocked by, you know, even a foot of overburden. Um, Correct. Those gravity signals will be very clear. Yep, absolutely. That's certainly not blocked by any that much overburden. And the and even to hear you say it there and looking at the map, the footprint in the area that you're looking at, uh, pretty small around here, you know, under a couple hundred meters, certainly. Yep. 
any indication yeah. of uh, step out and and stuff uh, nearby? Well, that's with what we did. Um, again, applying a, a figuring out the geological model first. Yes. We definitely see some potential for um, for following up some of these zones, especially where Dante was. Um, Dante, we can actually see it maybe branching into do two different areas. So yeah. those will need to be follow up. Um, Ivan, where we are um, between Ivan and Dylan, there is a good chance that below the surface we will see those pick up as well. Yeah. So yes, Wonderful. there's um, um, with with the Charles and Bell area. That's for that one. I think we would again use the gravity to really really help us push forward. Well, all of them will use the gravity to help us push forward and, and figure out uh, where to go next. But and yeah, follow up. Will it will the gravity survey work really with such a small uh, area? You know how how fine of a, of a measure is it really at those tight spacings? Oh, it's it's very fine. The thing with gravity is it's not like a typical uh, it's not like a typical survey where it's measuring a swath. Gravity is literally a point on the ground. So wherever your gravity meter is set up, that's what it's measuring. It's measuring right below you. It has you know it's not measuring a meter away. So you do have to have enough density to to make sure you intersect these bodies in a couple spots so that you can tie them in. But um, that's because we're what we're seeing are also basically sub horizontal. Uh, we don't need to have as tight as a spacing as we would if it was a vertical body. Yeah, sure. And and reading and seeing again mention of the erosion um, that would have expose these things i wonder geochem surface sampling mm, possibly i'm not a i'm not a big fan of uh surface geochem i i know that it works for some people uh, especially in in gold areas but uh, yeah. for us again going forward because we we have such a high density contrast with um uh with with the host rock and the yeah. and the monazite that the gravity survey is actually cheaper than sending in samples and it's easier <laughs> to collect gravity samples than it is to collect um, soil samples. Anything to keep it out of the labs. Uh, that's yeah, great. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> I wonder, and you said this summer. Yep. Summer 2019 yep. Um, and stuff coming in bef uh, between now and then. Yeah, we've, so we've got, um, we have some black sand beach samples that were concentrated with um, heavy minerals, well, as they typically are. Those have gone in for for a study, and so that study's still ongoing. We don't know when we'll expect to see results from that, hopefully within not too long of a time frame. And we've also got some samples that we will push onto the lab for some initial metallurgy studies, just doing yeah. some tabling so we can understand how it all works. Uh, again, the beautiful thing about sending everything to the SRC lab here in Saskatoon is that they have an knowledgeable staff who know how to work with monazite, know how to process it. Um, I guess one of their last clients that they that they did this for, uh, they hit it right on the first try because they've had such an experience with working with monazite. They they know how to do it. They know how to make it all efficient. They know how to to frack it and and get the uh, get the rare earths out of monazite. So again, another big another big huge uh, help for us in that regard. Yep. <clears throat> Wonderful. And yeah. So we're again we're we're very excited about everything that's happening over at Alsa's and uh, 2019 is just going to be it's going to be such a huge year for us. <laughs> well, things are heating up out there, right? Um, chatter around uranium continues. I wonder Absolutely. any news or talk around um, any of the uranium assets. Yeah, we are considering it. We're looking into it. Again, everything always comes down to financing, if we have a budget for it or not. Yep. But um, no, we have it on the plates. Um, I'm working on permits, actually. Uh, better to have the permits in than, than not. Certainly. So, yep. But we have some we have some exciting targets at Loringer that still require drilling. Uh, I'm very excited about some of these targets, and I'll be honest, they keep me up at night sometimes, just thinking about <laughs> them. Uh, I, th I think now would be a great time to actually, you know, make a discovery. It's yeah. the market, uranium yeah. market's up 40%, 50% on the year. So it's one of the best performing commodities out there. And 
the the, um, the contracts contracts look like they're going to be coming back online. Uh, spot price and, and yep. contract prices will get boosts. So yeah, I think uh, if we can make a discovery at this time before you know before everyone else really gets involved in it, I think we'll have a lot of eyes looking at us. Well, there's people chomping at the bit, so you better be quick to act, right? This is yeah, time is- exactly. <laughs> Yep. The rare earth stuff too. That's that seems to be catching more attention um, lately. A lot of news items around that, and you know, a small group of companies really focused on it. Um, and you guys, it's good to see you working on that in Saskatchewan. Yep. I, won- yeah, we- I wonder. I wonder how long it's been. Um, Again, I think I asked this to you before, but just to ask again, like when it was that you guys really started thinking about this as a potential for Alsa's Lake as a rare earth exploration project? Yeah, well, before I joined the company, um, you know, Tom Drivers, our CEO and president, he, he staked it. He had a prospector stake it back in uh, 2010, 2011. So they saw the potential back then. And unfortunately, the the price spike and the price decline uh, due to the whole uh, Japanese Chinese issue and in the same years that kind of killed the killed the spot price or killed killed the prices and a lot of things for a lot of people there was pretty yeah, yeah wild yeah, times kidding. yeah so since then it has come back on um, there has been more renewed focus and like you said between that time though too we've seen a lot of resurgence in in wind energy they, that's really getting a push forward uh, the electric vehicles are really making a strong run forward, which are going to are going to demand a lot of these permanent magnets. So there is a the demand is out there, and the demand is growing, and that's and that's not all. Either. There there are far more applications, uh, technological applications that do require rare earth elements, and yeah, us us living in a technological world is a great thing for the rare earth industry. <laughs> Well, and, and specifically NDPR there, uh, 4.6% in one of the intercepts. Um, and lots of lanthanum and cerium as well. Um, yep. Yeah, all the interesting stuff that comes along with the mineralogy of these rare earth deposits, figuring out. Yeah. <laughs> For the most part, because NDPR is the big push right now in the rare earth industry, um, you know, you can almost consider what we are is, is an NDPR uh, deposit. Uh, with all of the other elements as as uh, potential byproducts, basically. Well, yeah, it's it would seem that way, you know, based on the grades in in this exploration drilling, and then as well the value drivers associated with that. Yeah, it's, it's clear. Um, and just to point out again that you know this isn't a uranium project that's made the pivot to being a rare earth one as well. That's something that seems to be fairly clear from me from the relatively low uranium concentrations in there and something that yeah for the careful speculator out there who's trying to you know be careful watch um, pay attention to what's being recycled right on the street and and in, in looking for real genuine discovery um focused and and clear something that's new to the market can be important too so kudos to you for bringing that forward Thanks. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point that you make. Yeah, this is completely non-recycled project. This is this is a standalone rare earth project. And the company fifty eight point share fifty eight point four million shares out um, seventy six fully diluted. No debt or anything like that on the books. Hopefully, nope. Just checking. You never never know. Sometimes. (laughs) And and good for you. um, Also, in getting some community and stakeholders people online at least that i bump into from time to time who seem to be big fans of yours and and supporters of the company um really important to have people out there who know the story and are talking about it um thanks to them as well for bringing it to my attention absolutely thank you all out there oh without without you guys uh, we couldn't make this happen it's amazing isn't it uh what a business <laughs> Maybe I should get back on social media. I got hacked ages ago on Facebook. Uh, so. Probably not. Uh, so. You know, just uh, as much as you can make appearances, um, 
it's that's for the best but it's it's a tough place to get out there and waste your time better your time better spent uh pouring over old maps and out in the field prospecting for new stuff maybe or yeah. or better yet uh marketing the project around the world in the international financial centers where you know the people who would take a look at stuff like this are i gotta admit that is a fun that's a fun thing i like to do yeah i love, telling, there, I love telling the appia stories is there plans for a road show are you are you hitting the going to anywhere in particular yeah we recently had a couple of meetings in toronto new york just to get a feel for what's out there and see who's interested and wanted to hear our story so i think uh, we were well we were definitely very well received which was uh, a great thing and people are again like you said people are getting more aware of the rare earth story and so when they see the grades like this you know they're, they're very interested in it so yeah, we are. Uh, we're we're still getting our name out there, which is what we definitely yeah. need to do. Well, and it's funny because the people who you know really watch these stocks might um, say, "Well, we haven't seen you at this conference or that conference," and it's like, "Yeah, that's okay." There's lots of stuff that happens before we start going to those conferences, too, right? So yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and this, we're still small fries, right? And the exploration results here, you have to have something to market, and hey, there it is. Uh, yeah, once we can prove that the metallurgy is favorable, which I honestly don't see why it wouldn't, because it's, it's all monazite, and even with these black sand results, that uh, hopefully we'll get you know, relatively soonish. Um, yeah, it's. I, I think we just keep we keep adding more to the story, and it yeah. it just keeps proving itself that it is something feasible. Certainly. Mr. James Sykes, Vice President of Exploration, Appia Energy Corp, uh, API on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Thanks very much for talking to me. Thanks again, Peter. It's always a pleasure. Bye for now.